What's up, gang? Welcome to The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius from Shaw's Day. I'm so pumped to have you here with me. Now listen, The Greatness Machine, we're about two things. Number one, people who live in their passions. And number two, those who are creating greatness in the world and doing both of these things despite the odds against them. Each episode, we're going to feature interviews with game changers, business leaders, you know, telling us their origin stories, what made them tick, what got them to where they are now. Why? So it can help you step into your greatness within your life, your business, and your career. Occasionally, you might hear a few solo episodes from myself, moi, as I say, as I leverage my 20 years of entrepreneurship as a CEO and founder to help you grow and level up in your journey to scale your life and your business. So come be a fly on the wall, enjoy the conversation, and I'm stoked to have you here with me. Guys, welcome to today's episode of The Greatness Machine. I'm your host, Darius Machazi, and boy, do we have a special guest. My man, Adam Coffey, is in the house. What's up, Adam? How are you, Darius? Hello to all your listeners out there. Good to see everybody. Ooh, I love that, man. Just uh, coming at me with some fire. <laughs> got to get, get the blood pump in here. Yeah, we're going to do some burpees. <laughs> That's it. Man, welcome to the show, man. I'm so pumped to have you here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. We, you know, we got thunderstorms rolling through. So if the power goes out, just give me a few seconds for the backup generator to kick in and, and I'll be right back. Generac, baby. Generac. That's it. That's it. <laughs> and you're so, in hey, Texas now, so you can appreciate those it, te- Texas thunderstorms. Oh, I love them, man. They love, they, especially at night. They're great for sleeping. I they love are, thunderstorms they are. for sleeping Best weather. sound machine you know, on the planet right there. <sighs> White noise, baby. White noise. Um, hey, do you mind if I do a little housekeeping and we'll get pumping here? No, you, you, you do that. Awesome. So uh, for listeners who are new to the show, we're about two things. People are living their passions and those who are creating greatness in the world doing so despite the odds. And my man, Adam, is not as short of passion nor greatness. So um, I'm going to say this. Uh, I am uh, um, my friend, JT Fox, uh, was doing you were you were on his stage, uh, I believe, one of his big, big events. And uh, and, I, and I started looking. I'm like, man, this guy's done a ton of m and uh, I'm I myself am getting into private equity right now from the operation side, operating side. And uh, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I want to learn more, more, more about this guy. And I, and I dug in once I saw that you were doing some stuff with GT. And and I was like, hey, dude, let's get him on the show. So I had my team reach out. You're so gracious to join us here. And man, here we are, just getting ready to chop it up, greatness machines, style lay. And uh, yeah, I, I was uh, really excited to get to do that with you. Um, I'd love to go over your formal bio for our audience, if you don't mind, and then uh, we'll get going on and into some of the origin story of how you created all this greatness. Does that work for you? Sounds good. Let's do it. All right, baby. Um, so Adam is a CEO, board member, and best-selling author. We're going to be talking about some of his books. He, first of all, uh, has the number one best-selling book, the Private Equity Playbook, as well as the Exit Strategy Playbook. He's got a third book coming out called Empire Builder. So pumped about that. Third time's a charm, and he's already had a couple of charms under his belt. Uh, man, just like built some really big businesses, uh, led three national service companies, achieving enterprise value of over a billion dollars, which is no small feat, completed 58 add-on acquisitions. We're talking an M&A machine at an average exit of five times MOIC. That's multiple uninvested capital for people that don't know what that means. And man, he's been named the most influ- influential leader by the Orange County Business Times uh, in 2018, 19, 20, and 21. So man... You are quite an accomplished individual, my friend. Well, it's, uh, you know what? Life is short. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Till then, I've got lots to do, lots of ground to cover. And, you know, all these little careers that have kind of been inside, you know, the, 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 this entire period, you know, all these different little careers, side careers, it's been a lot of fun. I love that, man. So here at the uh, Greatness Machine, we love origin stories. Adam, I'd love you to kind of take us back. Like, you know, I know you didn't wake up one morning and start building billion dollar companies and normally that comes through a lot of scar tissue and i uh, love if you told us a little bit about your background sure man you know what i i, I grew up just outside of detroit in the the late 1960s through the 1970s and so as a result of that there were like three channels on tv you know i'm, I'm joking maybe there were five you know and there were no video games computers social media all this stuff so we played sports every day you know the neighborhood would get together we'd play sports so i was kind of a jock and after high school, went in the service. Um, Ronald Reagan's president inspired me, uh, and, and I, I took you know took my skills to the to the United States Army. I tell people the, the military early in my life taught me something about discipline, teamwork, and leadership. From there, out of the service, I had a first career as an engineer. Engineering made me a meticulous planner. Then I had ten year run with Jack Welch at uh, GE. 
uh, you know, the Camelot era, boy, GE is the world's most admired company. Jack's the world's most admired CEO. This is before tech. Uh, and, and GE is the, the hundred year old company largest on the planet. And its stock is splitting every three years. Great time to learn how to run a business. And I credit GE with teaching me how to run a business. And then the fourth thing, which you already covered 21 years as a, as a CEO. So literally, you know, Darius, when I, when I left home, when I got out of high school, I looked up, I saw bubble gum on the bottom of somebody else's shoe. That's how low I started on the totem pole as a private in the United States Army. I've held every job a person can have, you know, on a, an organizational chart from, you know, guy driving a truck all the way up to, to CEO. And so life's been an adventure. It's been a journey. Uh, I never stop moving you know, always working towards some, you know, the next goal and objective and uh, had a lot of little sub careers, like I said, during during that run. I've been a soldier. I've been an engineer. You know, I, I, I was a GE guy. I've been a CEO, a best selling author. You know, JT's put me on the stage and you know, now I'm like a, a, a Tony Robbins Jr. kind of guy and uh, and having a lot of fun doing that. And I spent 15 years also uh, as a guest speaker at, at, at UCLA in the Anderson Business School, um, talking to executive MBAs. And it was there where I started really learning how to give back. And, uh, you know, that that led to the books and that led to kind of a career switch where I hung up my CEO cleats and now I do consulting work. Nice. So when you started, when, you know, starting off in the military and kind of segueing into business, you know, tell us a little bit about, about that transition. I mean, I, I'm guessing that you didn't start off just, you know, running your own business. Did, did, did I get, did I miss that? Or did you just go straight to entrepreneurism? No, I, I definitely was a corporate guy. So military, uh, again, I learned how to work on confidential radar and missile systems. Um, and when I got out of the service, you know, and, and started a career as, a, as an engineer, I, I learned just how close a CAT scanner is to an air defense radar system. And so I excelled as an engineer in the, the medical field, um, which led me to uh, GE. And again, GE was the corporate training. So I very much was, call it, in a big organization like the military, and then an engineer working for a, a Fortune number one company for, for 10 years, first as an engineer, and then crossed over and, and went to uh, business school. Uh, at GE's Crotonville and then started managing and learning how to how to manage a business, became a turnaround guy, started climbing the corporate ladder. And so it wasn't until I left GE and became a, a CEO for the first time. You know, again, those three national companies were backed by nine different private equity sponsors. And so I became a PE guy before I knew what the heck PE was. And I was chasing title and money. To be honest with you, you know, it was first chance to go be a, a president of a company. And I remember going to my, my, uh, my GE corporate mentor and, and saying, geez, what do you think? Should I leave GE, the mothership, and go be a CEO for the first time? And the most sage advice I ever got was one line. Adam, once a president, always a president. Go, mm. my friend. You know, and so my own boss at GE suggested I take that first role as president. And he was right. He wasn't wrong at all. And so... You know, that launched me off into what I'll call the world of private equity and entrepreneurism. So with, with the, the, when you went out and did that, when you said that there was the private ac equity sponsors, were these sponsors outside of GE or were they like parts of the GE e ecosystem? No, they were definitely outside of GE. So GE had this thing, you know, world's most admired company, world's most admired CEO. As you were climbing the ranks, as you were getting close to the general manager level, um, and you graduated from GE Crotonville, uh, it was like somebody, probably the janitor was selling the class list of who, who, who had just you know, gotten out of school there. And immediately your phone starts ringing and it's recruiters trying to recruit you out of GE. Confidential search, you know, retained search, you know, some company taken private by a, a PE firm, failed public company, you know, looking for a CEO. And, uh, and my name somehow came up on their radar. And again, this is before LinkedIn or social media. How the hell they found me, I have no idea, but they, but they did. And so um, going back to GE, because I just picked up on this. So you were there during the Jack Welch days. I was. How was that? How, yeah. Yeah. How was Magical. that? Magical. Magical. You know, I, I think people look at him with a different lens today. It, he, he was, you know, it was the world's largest company. 
it was the you know the original Dow component on the the Dow Stock Exchange. This hundred year old behemoth, the largest company in the world, its stock was splitting every three years in the during the ten years that I was there as a young guy. I thought money just rained out of the sky, and every time you got stock options, they would double every three years. I, I, I thought I thought, hey, money's easy. Just come to GE and be a rock star, and uh, and money falls out of the sky. So it was a magical time to learn how to run a business. You know, at that time when you were, were going to Crotonville, which is their, their college up the Hudson River, you know, it was the GE business leaders who were coming in to teach you the, the top 5% of GE's leadership, you know, how to run a business, you know, a global business. And it was uh, a magical time to be learning how to be a manager, you know, at, at GE. How many years did you say you worked under Jack? Uh, 10 years, 1991 yeah. to 2001, his last 10 years. Yeah, it's so funny. Like people talk so much shit on him now, and and it's easy, you know. It's a, it's like total armchair quarterback bullshit, as far as I'm concerned. And secondly, it's like hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like you weren't there, you didn't have the context of the time. Yes, you could. I've I've seen some comparisons between Costco and GE, and and you know, and it's easy to make that comparison today. But at the time, the stuff he was doing was a revolutionary, and b like scoreboard. Like yes, like and and this is really interesting. If you really look, there's a book, Good to Great that a lot of people love yep. and and when you read that book it's like 80 or 90 percent of the companies there are not like these like world-renowned companies anymore but at the time they were the visionary companies of that time so i think that has more to do with the, the fact that things cha are changing a lot faster now than they were then what do you think about that so i i think yes you know armchair quarterbacks you know throwing cheap shots at jack you know 20 years 30 years after he you know he he left the seat at the time the world's most visionary leader running the world's largest company and killing it, you know, just is doubling in size every three years. So it was a magical time. I've got some great GE stories too, boy, that there's another podcast. I can tell you about being the number one business unit at GE walking into a board meeting with a boom box that was blasting out Pink Floyd song money, wearing dark <laughs> sunglasses with a, a cigar in my mouth. And having people on my leadership team walking in behind me, throwing up monopoly money in the sky. And it was like, it was like, it was the best of times to be, you know, to be a, a young maverick, you know, inside the world's most admired company with the world's best leader. Yeah, I love that, man. I did a podcast, I think it came out last week, which was basically, there's an article written by Neil Patel, uh, Lessons on Winning and Profitability from Jack Welch. Great article. But um, I'm going to throw a couple numbers out. I talked about it in this podcast. Market cap in 81, when he took over, was $13 billion. Market cap in 99, $525 billion. Yeah, like, so tell, tell me he sucked, right? Tell yeah, me. He hey, you wasn't. suck. <laughs> it's like, come on, man. Like, they went from 4,000 employees to 340,000 employees during that time. So when people talk shit, I'm just like, listen, like – like business is not some panacea. You're not going to get it all right. I'm sure there's decisions yeah. that were made that maybe didn't work out and you figured out later, but that's, those are, that's a real scoreboard and those are real numbers. And, you know, taking revenue from 27.9 billion to 111 billion earnings from 1.6 billion to 10.7 billion. Those are real numbers. So yeah, I'm with you, man. Like I'm sure quarterbacks nowadays talking shit about Jack Welch. I'm like, come on, man. Like this guy was like, literally he's the goat from his era. And that, that's at least the way I see it. Yeah. So, all right. We see eye to eye on that one. I we do. That. We do. <laughs> I'm with so, you, brother. So, and, and look, man, I'm like a conscious leader and like, there's, there's time, there's things that worked in the nineties. I started, you know, I'm, 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 I'll be 40, I'm 45. I just turned 45 years old. So I was like graduated college in 2000. So I'm like part of that. And my dad was not born in the United States, total autocratic leader, you know, old school, born 1939, out of the U.S. I said that's like being being born in 1889 in the U.S. So, like, dude, when I was graduating college, like, this is like, dude, it was like gnarly in the workplace. Like, it's not like it is now, not even close. Like, there's a lot of things you have to be concerned about now that, like, it was the opposite day on all this stuff. Yeah. You know, you could grind on your employees, and like, it was it was much more top down leadership. And and so, if you start to put into context a lot of Jack's principles, you're like, he was ahead of his time. It's just maybe not out of context with the, with how far things have gone. What are your thoughts on that when you start thinking about leadership that works in today's world compared to maybe when 30 years ago when you were at GE? 
Well, you know, I, I, I credit GE with teaching me what I'll call a lot of the, the basic core beliefs and, and methodologies that I still use today. But you know, I think the military for me made me a servant leader before we knew that it was called servant leadership. I think the, the military teaches people how to, you know, how, how to lead from the front, from the trenches, taking care of, of those around you. And, and so if you put servant leadership coming out of the military with the methodologies of, of Jack Welsh and, and what I learned there, I, I would say that what I do today is broadly accepted. What I was doing as a CEO you know, way back when, when I first started my CEO career, which was in 2001, right when Jack left GE is when I was starting my CEO career outside of GE. And at that time, I, I would say that a belief that that culture and profit were connected and that by taking care of people, you could build a strong culture. You know, those people would would get engaged. They would take care of customers. Revenue would rain from the so, you know from the skies. And so I was connecting, you know, being good to people with making shareholders maximum value and, and, and maximum profit. So I, I learned early on that revenue and culture are, are correlated. I was running service businesses. You can't store service in, in, in a box and put it on a shelf. So it, in, if you can't store your product on a shelf, your product obviously is your people. So I learned very early. And so I would tell you, I took what I learned at GE, which was the systematic approach. Business requires initiatives. N initiatives require management systems, you know, and you have to manage leadership and 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 get you know all of these things. But then what I learned about servant leadership in the military, and then my my observations about service companies, all that kind of led me to a different place that I, I would say was not mainstream in two thousand one. It is today. So today, what's our problem? We can't get enough employees. You know, everybody right. wants to be treated, you know, in a in a in a different kind of fashion today than they did in the 1990s. And I would say I was an early adopter of recognizing that people were the secret to my success. I couldn't manage revenue as a, a CEO. I needed to manage culture and that would drive engagement and that would lead to revenue. And so I, I'd like to think I was a little bit of a visionary coming out of GE and melding that with servant leadership and then the meticulous planning from the military put all that together. I was uh, I was what I would call a modern leader today, but I was doing that, you know, back in 2001, 22 years ago. Nice. And so when you when you rolled out and it's, so, I mean, nowadays they have what search search firms, right? Search, uh, sure. search funds, excuse me, where they're where they got the business and they're looking for the CEO to come in and kind of kind of take it over and take it to the next level. It sounds like yours was kind of a version of that. Like a search, a, a search was done. You were brought into, it was it a failing business, this, the services business? It was a public company that was taken private by kind of a distressed asset private equity firm. And they sold off a bunch of pieces, recaptured all their investment. And they were left with this core service business that had been around for about 40 years and it was struggling. And my job was to to rebuild it, you know, to rescue it, to save it. It was the ultimate turnaround. Multiple times I thought that we might have to put chains on the doors, you know, and the, wow. the, it, this was a patient with barely a pulse when I got there. There were days where I had to go into a, a meeting room with my leadership team and say, folks, we're not leaving until we find X million in costs, you know, cuts, you know, and it was, it was, uh, it was a patient that was on life support. But we brought it back from the dead and we actually blew it out, then sold it to uh, wound up getting sold to to Berkshire. And then it became a division of Aramark. And, you know, meanwhile, I had rolled off to my, my second company and I thought medical equipment service wasn't very sexy. I want to do something sexier. So then I went and ran a commercial laundry company. I thought, boy, no. <laughs> laundry, that's sexy. That's oh. where I want to be. And then that was my first, you know, billion dollar business right there. My first billion dollar exit was, was I actually ran that laundry company for 13 years and four months. And I had three sets of shareholders, you know, over that 13 year period. So good times. How, how, how big, um, when you say, uh, obviously a night or was a 10 figure exit, how many, how many head count, how big of a staff did you guys have? So it was around 1500, you know, it was around a thousand when I started, it was around 1500 when I left, but that thousand, I mean, I, I, there were periods of, of, I started with a national company. I sold off pieces of the business, fell back to a three state company modernized it. The three state company I sold the first time out earned the 30 some odd state company I started with. 
So I, I, I was bigger, then I got smaller, and then I did 34 acquisitions across you know, a couple different hold periods with, with private equity firms. I invaded Canada. I went from a zero to a 90% market share in Canada in a two-year period you know, by, by buying you know, three of the four largest companies doing what I was doing in Canada. And so it was, uh, it was, it was the first you know, five years was family owned and operated. It was a family office. It was uh, modernization, selling it off in pieces, getting smaller, but getting more efficient. And then taking that, selling it to private equity, and then expanding out across the country and, and up into Canada. So different lives each hold period, for sure. So when you say hold period, what, when you mean, what, what's, explain what that means. Is, if the listener is not clear, when you say hold sure. period, so, what does a, that mean exactly? A, a PE fund exists for a 10-year period. Got During it. the first five years of a PE fund, they're buying companies. During the middle five years, let's call it, they're, they're improving companies, growing companies. And then towards the tail end of the fund, they're selling the companies, returning capital to shareholders. So a hold period is, is from the time one PE firm buys you until it sells you to somebody else. That's the hold period. Average hold periods around five years uh, in, a, in a typical PE environment. Got it. So, so from one sponsor to the next. So you're selling Correct. from one. So you're getting one sponsor backing you. You sell to the next sponsor. You guys create new sets of value, and then you're selling to the next sponsor. Correct. And private equity is very disciplined in its approach. I call it the PE pyramid. You know, there's five trillion in assets under management today. All these different size firms and funds, and literally, I, I call them swim lanes of a. You think of a PE as a pyramid, and as you're climbing the pyramid and stepping. You're moving from one swim lane to the next. And there's one group of PE firms at the bottom, another group of PE firms, the next step up. And there's five layers to that pyramid between small to public company. And so w was there a, a part of the pyramid that you preferred more than the other? Oh, great question. And yes, to people out there who have Fortune 500 logos on your business card, listen up. Um, when it comes to private equity, I love the lower middle market. Why? Because if I take a company and start with a company that's got 15 million worth of EBITDA, that swim lane goes to about 50 million of EBITDA, and then I'm gonna sell it to someone who goes from 50 to 100. That sweet spot of 15 to 50, I, I, I can make such a big impact so quickly. If I buy seven or eight companies, I can climb that, that, that gap and I can get from 15 to 50 while I'm growing organically, while I'm improving margins. And everybody all up and down the pyramid is all modeling the same three times multiple of invested capital, you know, four, four X multiple is a good day. My career average of five is a phenomenal day, but you know, everyone's making the same amount of return. So if I'm a, a, a CEO who's being granted equity, it's based on the return profile. If I'm investing capital, it's you know, what I get back is based on that, that multiple of invested capital. And so the end result is if I'm at the bottom of the pyramid in the lower middle market, I make that, it's, it's just easier to make that. If I'm at 100 million of EBITDA trying to go to 200 million of EBITDA, the magnitude of work that I have to do to pull that off in about five years is four times the work it is lower in the pyramid. So I love the lower middle market. I think it's the place to be. That's the, the, I'll call it 4 million to 15, 15 to 50, 50 to 100. That for me is the sweet spot for wealth creation for mm. CEOs, C-suite executives, people who get granted equity and are, are running companies for PE. It's interesting because down there, you know, I've, I built my last company I built from really a small group of us, 30 of us to a thousand of us. And, and I, I joked, I said, oh, five different companies in the life of, of, of that growth. And it grew to about 200 million of top line revenue. And, um, and it was, you know, it was a little company. And so to your point that you're, if I double from 50 to a hundred staff, or I you know, I double from five to 10 million of even top line revenue, that's a double, right? And then I double from that 10 to 20, it's double again, to 20 to 40, 40 to 80, 80 to 160. That's four or five doubles in there, right? As yeah. opposed to if I'm doubling from 100 to 200, we got up 200 million in revenue. I was like, shit, man, it's hard to grow it at this point, right? Like, like we kind of capped out. hard to grow it. You know, to get a four times multiple of invested capital, leaving kind of, um, you know, the, the fact that multiples are expanding as you're getting bigger. You know, I, I mean, you got to grow it better than 30% a year and hold that kind of growth rate really forever. 
And it's, uh, it, it, when I'm getting to a company, you're talking about a company that's been in business for 40 years. All three of the companies I ran had been around for about 40 years before I got there. They were growing at a lazy, sleepy pace and kind of slapping that pig, you know, and saying, wake up, baby, and let's, let's grow to, you know, at 30% a year. That, that takes some effort. You know, I call it bending the growth curve. Jim Collins calls it the flywheel effect. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's not easy to do, but it's easier to do and hold it lower in the middle market for sure. Once you get up to that couple, you know, 100 million in EBITDA, I'm talking five, 600, 700 million of revenue, you know, doubling that, that, yeah. you know, th that takes some time, that takes some effort and the return profiles at the top of the pyramid start, start moderating very quickly. And, you know, if you're KKR, Apollo or somebody at Carlisle and you've got a, a $20 billion fund, you know, Blackstone, it's hard to get a 4X multiple of invested capital. You're lucky if you're underwriting two and a half and getting, you know, getting somewhere between two and three. What, um, so when you started thinking of the, the, I, I mean, I, I, my experience, and I, again, I, I ran smaller businesses than you ran, but they're pretty good sized businesses for a bootstrapper. Um, and my experience was it was a hell of a lot easier for me to run a thousand person organization than it was for me to run a hundred person organization. Did, do you feel like that continues to scale as you get bigger? So that, that was something else too, you mentioned. So I, I, I also like the lower middle market where I, I'll call it big enough. I call it have enough clay on the potter's wheel so that I can make something with it. So it, it's not about easier or harder. It's, it's that when I get into an organization, if they've got, let's say a hundred million to 300 million of revenue, I've got a lot of clay on the potter's wheel and I can redirect spend and I've got enough there that I can start making my own investments and in, in how I want to restructure the company for, you know, what's going to be a bend the curve growth run. And if I'm too small, you know, then there's not enough capital. There's not enough clay on the potter's wheel to work with it. So I, I also love the, the lower middle market when you, I'm going to call it a hundred million in revenue minimum you know, and 200 preferable, you get into that area, I can redirect spend, I've got enough clay to work with to where I can do a lot of special things without the need for a bunch of capital to come in. What do you think about like when you start looking at businesses? So I'll use my, my business was a mortgage servicing business. We were, I, I used to joke that we're, we're, we're a pile of assets that we just got to like not fuck up. Right. So we're <laughs> Like, like that, I mean, you know, when you're, again, to your point, a couple hundred million dollar company and, and that was about the size I got to, um, it, it was like, Hey, look, like you, when you make a mistake, it can be a seven figure mistake. So like, cause you're, cause it's big enough. Sure. And, and, but you can also cut costs, you know, fairly easily because there's a lot there to play with to your point. When you start thinking of taking a company that's a couple hundred million dollar company, what type of industries do you like to play with? Because for me, like my my issue with the business I was in was I'm like, ah, super commoditized. And like we were playing against everyone that was private equity backed and we weren't. We had bootstrapped the business. And so it got to a point where I'm like, Dude, the only way we can even play in this game is if we raise capital from the big dogs because we're battling people who have capital from them. What are your thoughts on all that? Well, so first of all, what kind of business do I look for? Um, any company that I've been involved in, it's a buy and build. Just across the board, private equity makes the vast majority of their returns doing buy and build. Buy and build is the, the process of buying you know, 10, 20, 30 companies, putting them together. And so fragmentation is highly uh, important if you're doing a buy and build. I need, I need 20, 30,000 small companies because there's not enough buyers for those companies to possibly drive up the prices. I can buy companies typically at, at I'll call it four to five times multiple, you know, or, or uh, you know, four to five times EBITDA. And then as I'm building my, my company and climbing the pyramid and I'm putting more and more clay on the wheel, you know, 20 companies later, you know, I, I'm selling for 14, 15 times and I'm making 10 turns on a, you know, so I buy a dollar of EBITDA and when I sell it three years later, four years later, I'm getting 15 for it. And so that $14 differential for really doing nothing other than acquiring a bunch of companies and, and putting them together, 
that arbitrage, it's called, is where the vast majority of private equity returns are generated. So to do that has to be a fragmented industry. I love service companies because service companies tend to be very low capital expenditure you know, mm. related. Doesn't you know if you think about building a real estate empire, I need gobs and gobs and mountains of cash to buy stuff. If I'm in a service company, you know, multiple people have built good example, you know, multiple people have built billion dollar landscape companies. So you know, what's my unit level economics? I need a truck, a two person crew, a lawnmower, a weed whacker, a blower and a shovel and a rake. You know, and it's like if I and, and so it's very low capital expenditures. I don't have plants. I don't have right. a bunch of tooling and dyeing and manufacturing and raw material. Service businesses are great because they tend to be high margin, low CapEx. Low CapEx means a lot of cash flow. And that cash flow you can actually use to buy companies and the cash flow of the companies you're buying actually services the debt that's required. And so like in my last empire, I bought 23 companies and I used zero equity to buy those 23 companies. I bought them for an average price of five times uh, EBITDA. My banks and lenders would give me five times EBITDA. That's what my cash flow would, would service. And as an end result, you know, I buy 23 companies. You know, and I use 100% debt, and then I take that five times, I sell it for 15 times or 14 times, and then that arbitrage that's created is measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars, pure profit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and then you other... grow organically, and you do the margin improvement, and as you're getting bigger, you're creating operating leverage. So my expenses are growing at a slower pace than my revenue is, and that differential is also creating higher margins. And so end result is it's not just about buy and build, but buy and build enables me to then also cross sell. You talked about competition and, and how there was always fierce competition. You know, in MBA speak, that's called red ocean. You know, it's red from the blood of competition. Anytime I'm building an empire, I'm always looking for strategic pivots. How can I take what is commoditized and make strategic pivots to find, you know, blue ocean where there's not as much competition, where the margins are higher. And I do that in every empire I've built. You know, I've created these strategic pivots. You know, when I was running an HVAC company, um, we were really a refrigeration service company doing grocery store refrigeration. My largest customer was Walmart. You know, God bless Walmart, but when they're your largest customer, you're also the lowest bidder. Well, if, uh, if you want to make money, being the lowest bidder isn't necessarily the magic. But imagine when you make strategic pivots and you start servicing blood banks and data centers and mm. Amazon, you know, prime warehouses, places where people don't care about cost, they care about speed of service and they care about quality of service. Then all of a sudden you find different margin profiles and you blend them. Never leave that core business, it's keeping the lights on, but you're also building other revenue streams which are higher end. I also built a professional services division, engineering firms, energy optimization firms, that division was really earning about 50% of the EBITDA at the company, but it was only about 15% of the revenue. And the reality was we were being paid there as a consultant, not as a commoditized service provider. So I'm always thinking about what else can I do? Think about it like you go to McDonald's and someone says, you say, I want a Big Mac. Would you like that? Would you like the meal? Would you like to supersize that? Would you like an apple pie with that? It's like, I've got my landscape company. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm mowing, I'm blowing and going. And hey, your beds look pretty bad. Do you need mulching? You know, your sprinkler heads aren't working. You know, can I repair your sprinklers? You need holiday lighting. You know, how about landscape lighting? It's like, what else can I do for this golden thing called a customer? I love service businesses because they're high margin, low capital expenditure. I can grow them fast. I can use their own cash flow to pay for acquisitions. And at the end of the day, um, I can sell them for high multiples. I love that, man. Dude, you're a rock star, man. This is fun hearing how you think. And and it's really interesting. And it's no wonder you've created this much value. Let me ask you a, a question. And I want to talk a little bit about, about the books because you got these these great books. Um, when did you feel like you had finally like come into your own in, in, in doing this type of work? When did you feel like, yeah, I, I, I know what I'm doing. I feel like I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I know I'm learning, but I still feel like I know what I'm doing. Well, I had the youthful exuberance, call it, you know, when I was still in my 30s and a CEO for the first time. But I, I would tell you that, you know, it was long about 
I don't know, 10 years in. So about, you know, call it a 21 year CEO career before I got bored and wanted to do something else. Um, so about 10 years in, it's, it's like I really started to learn my craft, but I was still learning. And I recognize today, you know, that I was really, really good at the end. Boy, I just knew how I was a CEO whisperer. You know, I really knew how to do this. But, you know, I, I would also tell you when you're youthful, you have, you know, the the exuberance and the energy and the and the raw, you know, raw talent that's not honed. You make every mistake in the book, but you somehow survive and get through as you get older you're a lot wiser and you work a lot more methodically and it's maybe not as much of the splash as you had when you're in your 30s but boy you know the patience and the maturity sure add value to to that that journey so i I would say always been learning but at the same time probably 10 years in I really started to make what, what i would call conscious decisions i think in the first 10 years it was luck a little bit of luck, you know, a lot of tenacity and a lot of feeling it, you know, feeling it out and learning as you go. You know, last 10 years, yep, I got something here. Last five years, you know, I, I really know what I'm doing at, at this stage. And and then I made a pivot. You know, I, I was I, I was making a lot of money as a CEO, but I wasn't having any fun anymore. I was kind of bored running one company at a time. I wanted to help multiple people at a time. I was writing books. I was teaching great personal satisfaction from that wasn't making a dime. And so I literally wanted to figure out how do I swap these two things around? I want to impact multiple companies at a time. I want to help multiple CEOs and entrepreneurs. I want to write books to educate the next generation and give them the playbooks I didn't have when I was a young guy starting out. And now I serve on boards. I work you know, as an operating partner with PE firms, helping them with their investments. I work with founders and entrepreneurs who are ultimately eventually going to be growing and selling to private equity. And, and now I teach, you know, and you, you mentioned JT. JT was instrumental, you know, in getting me into, you know, onto a stage, call it, rather than a classroom and, you know, putting hundreds of people or thousands of people from around the world and, and teaching them all the entrepreneurial skills and the lessons learned you know, across a career. And so JT once told me, he said, the magic about me was there are those who can teach and they have no experience. There are those who have experience and they don't know how to teach, but me somehow have the ability to do both. I've got the experience and I know how to teach. And as a result of that, it's impactful to to audiences. So I, I blame JT for uh, for kicking that third you know avenue to life. So that's kind of the three things I, I'm doing now, and I'm having a lot of fun because I'm impacting hundreds or thousands of entrepreneurs at a time now, rather than just building one company. I love that, man. So let's talk about the books. I mean, you wrote the Private Equity Playbook, the Exit Strategy Playbook, and then you got the new book. Tell us a little bit about those books. Wh- who do they serve? What, wh- like, who's the audience, and what, what do they could they expect to learn from each one? Sure. of Sure. So I wrote the Private Equity Playbook in 2019, and I'll I'll tell you that you know I'm three books in now, and I'm much better at, at writing and much better at, at putting together a book. So I actually think my books, my newest books, are are higher quality than the first. But the first became an instant cult classic. It was written for two people. It was written for, I'll call it that, that entrepreneur who is building a business, probably a baby boomer who was starting to age out and wondering, you know, what do I do? My phone's ringing. This thing called private equity keeps calling me, you know, and, and I, I don't know a damn thing about private equity. Everything I hear on the news is negative. How do I think about that? It was either that avatar call it or it was the the mid-level fortune 500 executive whose phone's ringing and it's recruiters looking you know to convert them from mid-level you know corporate fortune 500 person to senior executive lower middle market pe back company and they don't know whether it's a good deal to leave the fortune 500 world the big name on the business card you know is it really you know uh, do you really have an ability to earn a seven figure annual income and an eight figure you know, call it payday and a nine figure net worth, you know, over there, you know, is that real? And so I wanted to educate business owners seeking to eventually monetize an asset, Fortune 500 transitioning executives. And I wanted to teach them about private equity. Private equity is a deep subject. You could write a thousand page textbook. And so what my philosophy was, let's just go not deep, but broad. And let's give everybody who spends four or five hours, I call my books, 
are, are all, you know, they're, they're kind of that five hour flight book. You can take off from LA, go to New York, you know, or, or from New York to London or someplace. And over that, you can have a bad meal, kick your shoes off, do some email. And then if you spend four or five hours, I'm going to teach you a wealth of information, you know, that I've picked up over, over 20 plus years as, as a CEO and the private equity playbook. That's, it was all about teaching people. And I'll, not to go off on a tangent, but I'll, I'll tell you, when I teach seminars to this day, if I get 100 entrepreneurs in a room, if I get 100 you know, successful business people and Fortune 500 executives in a room, I guarantee you when I give them a basic 10 question quiz on private equity, 90 plus percent of the room fails. I've been doing this since that book came out. I was doing it before that book came out. And it's like everybody fails. They've heard the term, but they really don't know how it works. And so my mm. books are to educate give you a base level of understanding so that you can quickly grab the concepts. I'm the cliff notes version of what private equity is about. Exit strategy, same thing. Although private equity is buying 50% of all companies on the planet, that means 50% are being bought by somebody else. So let's teach entrepreneurs how to navigate the decision process between strategic buyer, financial buyer, strategic buyer who keeps the lights on versus turns the lights off, Financial buyer, when you're a platform company versus being an add-on company to a platform, you know, all of these different, you know, IPOs, SPACs, ESOPs, you know, all these different directions. And so I wanted to break that down as a, as a guy who's bought 58 companies and, uh, and been through many sale processes, you know, I, I wanted to share those learnings and I did it with the ex exit strategy playbook. Third book literally just finished over the weekends called Empire nice. Builder. This is Congrats. the journey from zero to a billion. And this is the playbook. It's the only book any entrepreneur will need. I'll give you the toolkit you need and, and you'll be able to go through the stages of growth from, from zero to a billion once you get a hold of this book. So it's my favorite. You know, of course, it's my new baby and, uh, and it's my best, my best book to date. Love it, man. When's it? When's that supposed to come out? When are you it'll, expect it'll it be to... fall? It'll be this fall. It'll be available in all formats: so hardcover, softcover, Kindle, Audible. Um, you know, it, and so uh, target is to have it out by October in time for the holidays. Um, follow me on social media, and there will be more information coming out. The audiobook teaser was just uh, just finished, and so that'll get released here soon. Um, and as I do with all of my books, hundred percent of my royalties. Are donated to charity. It's how I, I fuel my philanthropic work is through the, uh, the 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 royalties I earn on my books. Awesome, man. Oh man, Adam. Um, you know, here at the Greatness Machine. First of all, I want to say this: like you, uh, this is like I, I had high expectations for this show, but this is you're you're exceeding my expectations. You really are a pro at what you do, and it's really cool to to hear just the way you think. And I think every entrepreneur needs to. A, get connected with you, B, read your books and see if they have the opportunity to work with you, try to work with you. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the working with you part. I know you're working with, as, as you mentioned, operating partner for some private equity. Are you working with, like, who's your ideal avatar as far as a client that you would want to work with that would, it would make sense for them to work with you? You know, it's funny because I, I love working with entrepreneurs at all stages of growth. So I literally am working with some entrepreneurs who are startups. And, you know, have, have, have no, no revenue, you know, at, at the time, you know, I, I start working with them. I'm working with other entrepreneurs who have, you know, have a hundred million plus in revenue. Um, and, and so really it's not about what my dreams are. It's about what your dreams are. And so I have different levels of engagement and, you know, my kind of my entry level is, is I, I charge my clients around 3000 a month. It's an hour a week, you know, it's via zoom. My, my contracts are month to month. If I don't add value, turn me off. But my goal and objective is to help you do wonderful things in your business very quickly. And, you know, so I, I work with, with literally with companies of, of all sizes, some of the largest PE firms on the planet and some of the smallest PE firms on the planet. And, and I love the challenges that they all bring to the table. And it's a, it's a way for me, you know, it really ups my game too. I'm getting a lot of great looks at companies. You know, so if, if, if you look in the last year, you know, I helped one entrepreneur exit his business. They, he made around 150 million. I helped another one exit at around 50 million. I just helped another one exit at 8 million. You know, and, and so these are different size entrepreneurs. They have different dreams, different goals and objectives. And it's great when I can, you know, what, what makes 
a great day for me is when they're hitting enter on their keyboard, you know, on closing morning and they're watching their bank account. And then whether it's it's eight million, you know, or it's 50 million or 150 million when they hit enter and then, you know, that gasp, you know, comes out when the money just hit. And I, I yeah. think that's that's my that's my social drug right there is is helping entrepreneurs you know get that get that feeling of exiting their first business being successful really for the first time i find you know i spend a lot of time with billionaires too and and i'll tell you that the difference between people who are billionaires and entrepreneurs who are bootstrapping it's all in the mind it really is you know uh, to be a billionaire doesn't make you anything more special than anybody else. They, they put on their clothes the same way. You know, they jump in their cars the same way. They may have fancier cars or someone else driving them. But I, I got to tell you, you know, that, that the magic to be successful is inside all of us. We have to calibrate the mindset first and we have to believe in ourselves, invest in ourselves and then execute. And if the world knocks us down, get back up. But we can't be afraid to try. And it's those who never try, who never get anywhere. 30 years from now, they're in the same cubicle and they're wondering, woulda, coulda, shoulda. You know, what if I'd have taken that shot long ago? And I think that the magic of this country is still in small business. There are 33 million small businesses in America. They represent 99.9% .9 of all companies in America. They employ 50% of the workforce of America. In this country, you can hang out your shingles, start a business, and you can become a billionaire. I love it, man. Oh, dude, we're getting near the end of the show. I, I, I always end every show with a question I call the greatness question. And so I'd love to ask, ask it to you. I actually, I always, I always tell people before, but you, you, you seem like you're good on your toes. So I'm going to surprise you with it at the end. Um, and then we'll, we'll get the, we'll, we'll connect uh, the audience with all the different ways they can connect with you. So you ready for the greatness question, Adam? Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. All right. What is the number one barrier to creating greatness that you have overcome in your life? And how did you overcome it? The aversion to risk and the, the, the shift, I just talked about the shift in the mindset that when I decide I'm going to be successful, I will not stop until I am successful. And so I, I would say that, you know, as a, as a young guy, I mean, if you go back to high school, Adam, high, high school, Adam, you know, would, would have been the guy afraid to ask out the pretty girl, you know, who, who he wanted to go out on a date with because he just assumed that this girl's never going to say yes. And I can tell you a real life story from my high school days, prettiest girl in school, nobody would ask her out because everybody assumed it was a no. She wound up marrying a boy that she babysat for, <laughs> literally. And so it was, it was learning to take that risk, to learn, you know, learning to say, I can do this. I'm not going to fail, you know, overcoming fear, overcoming anxiety, and just getting out there and, and doing that. And, you know, it, it, you don't necessarily learn that by flipping a switch. There's a lot of experiences we go through in life that, that teach us, you know, how, how, how to change our, our mindset. But I, I think for me, the, the biggest thing was recognizing that, look, I can be a private in the United States Army. I can be the lowest guy on the on the org chart, you know, the dude in the truck who's who's fixing CAT scanners at hospitals at night. But one day I can be the CEO and and one day I can be, you know, call it successful and a and a wealthy person and fly around in private jets. And there's no reason why you can't either. You just have to go out and do it, make it happen. It's not about what in life is holding you back. It's about what you're doing to overcome obstacles that are in your way. I love that, man. Adam, you're a badass. Uh, how can people connect with you? Where can they get learn more about the work you're doing, connect with you on all the work, get the books, all that good stuff? Uh, LinkedIn is the easiest. I'm on there 100 times a day now. Um, you know, So uh, LinkedIn, my name's Adam E. Coffee, C-O-F-F-E-Y. You can also find me at adamecoffee.com. Um, my books are on, on Amazon. You know, you can hear me on this fabulous podcast right here. But really, LinkedIn is probably where I, I first encounter most people. And they hear me on a podcast. They read a book that brings them into LinkedIn. 
And, uh, and then we go from there. I love hearing from people. You know, I hear from people every day, you know, hey, I read your book, loved your book. Thank you. It inspired me. You know, I, I love getting those kinds of message. I love interacting with, with people. I'm a people person. And, uh, and that's the fun part of, of my new call it life, you know, as a consultant, as a CEO whisperer, you know, as a, a teacher of, of seminars. Love it, man. Mr. Coffee, you're, you're, a, you're a saint. You're a badass. Love you here. Appreciate you here from the greatness machine. And uh, we're really excited for all the work that you're doing and going to continue to do. And we really want just so much gratitude having you here on the show. Darius, thank you for having me. Everybody out there, love you, appreciate you. And uh, we'll talk again soon. You guys heard it here straight. Go check out Adam. Check out his books. Hook up with him on LinkedIn. Until next time, peace out. We love you. You are listening to The Greatness Machine, and that's a wrap for today. Listen, if you love what you heard, subscribe to the show on whatever podcast platform that you're tuning in on so that you don't miss any of our future episodes. We have tons of great people coming on, and we're, we're stoked to have you here to enjoy it with us. Leave us a review. Tell us what you love most about this particular episode. We love getting the reviews. We love to see what you guys love most. And if this particular episode you know, made you think of someone who's leveling up in their business and in their life, print screen, share it with them. Leaders are the best givers. And after all, we're all here to support and grow with each other. And in case you want to see some of the fun behind the scenes shots or some of the things that we're doing, I'm actually writing about this in my weekly newsletter. Go to www.therealdarius.com and subscribe to my newsletter. We're talking about fun things like business and life and mindfulness and cryptocurrencies and gosh, I don't even know everything and anything, but it's tons of fun stuff I write about. I try to get it out on a weekly basis. You can subscribe at www.therealdarius.com. And with that said, look, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I love you. Peace. We're out of here. See you guys on the next one. Uh-huh. She's my lover.